stream. We are dreamed into existence. What we do with that dream is up to us. This is Stream. I am Jessica Deruta, and I share with you my stream of consciousness and host Sacred Conversations. Listen for free on your favorite podcast app and follow me on social media at Trust Psyche. The best way to show your support is by subscribing to my YouTube channel, Trust Psyche. Click the notifications bell to be updated about new monthly videos. One of the things I love most is teaching people all around the world to do what I do through online courses for all levels. Find me at TrustPsyche.com where you can begin studying astrology with me right now. Trust Psyche production and music by the lovely Travis Deruta. Let us begin. How we dream is as important as what we dream. For the what of the dream knows itself through the how. When the wisdom of the sky meets with the wisdom of the earth and is braided through the human heart, we will have a rainbow people. Angelus Arian, shared with me by Tessa Barr. This is stream 19. To listen to stream 18, please follow me on my Instagram account, trustpsyche underscore, where I did stream 18 there on Instagram Live. I'd really love for you to follow me on Instagram as I'm having a lot of fun posting and sharing there and occasionally recording live videos. Welcome to Stream 19. Today is May 24th, 2020, and I'm Jessica Deruzza, and I am here with Travis Deruzza, who just played that lovely intro for us lovely to be here with you jessica (laughs) i'm excited to be here with you and this venus retrograde um so i just got done recording um an instagram live and that was uh the last stream stream 18 and this one is coming directly after that Uh, i got done recording came into the kitchen you had gotten done with your call and I said, this is what happened. (laughs) I had to clear the pipes and, uh, you know, so let's talk about these things. And so here we are. I just wanted to maybe mention a couple fun, quirky Venus retrograde things that have been happening to start off. Sounds nice. So I think the first one is um, you and I have this really incredible uh, handmade deer drum. Uh, it's the hide of a deer <clears throat> and deer bone and it's a gorgeous hand drum we've had it for four years got it in Berkeley, California and when we moved to Florida the temperature change and the humidity the drum went flat and we have like literally not been able to play it for a year and a half, two years it dropped out I thought it was a a casualty of the climate change <laughs> And it's like literally been in our closet untouched. And for some reason the other night, we had a, well, we had, had a little ceremony here, a little ritual, and you decided to bring it out and put it on the altar. And turns out it sounds better than it's ever sounded. 
lo and behold, it was actually exactly back to the same pitch that it was at when I left it last. I recorded with it. We did the Dance of the Tarantula for Deepen Your Astrological Practice. And then after that was when it fell. And it was right back to the exact same pitch, A flat, that it was at when I did that. I mean, talk about Venus retrograde returning to a musical instrument that you thought you lost and it's like totally revived. <laughs> uh, so that was incredible. That that drum is so dear to me. Um, and a couple other fun things. Uh, we got a new piece of artwork. Grail, which I talked about in the last stream a bit by Tessa Barr. And... It's an amazing, incredible piece of art. You're in love with it. And I think not only receiving a piece of art during Venus Retrograde feels so special, but what happens, as sometimes does when you get a new piece of art, is we've like rehung all the art in our house. <laughs> Can I interject on, uh, on Grail for a minute? Yeah, please. It, uh, it makes me think of the tarot uh, associations. I wrote to Tessa about this one makes me think about the chariot card and how they say that one of the legends about the chariot card which has the astrological association with cancer is that the chariot inside carries the holy grail hmm. and the kind of the feminine warrior that directs the chariot carries inside this deep directive to bring the holy grail to the place that it's going to and I feel this Venus retrograde energy there, the, the fierce feminine warrior that carries, carries this grail that mm. braids the rainbow people together. Mm. Mm. I like that the, the, the piece comes from this idea of the rainbow people weaving together the above and the below through their hearts, through their embodied living, through their love. And um, what do you feel is the connection with the chariot, that the chariot is kind of fiercely caring and protecting this like most sacred path and truth? And you have such a deep connection with cancer. You're a cancer. In a way, it's one of your tarot cards. So you must have a pretty personal relationship with it, just some feelings. Feeling cancerian, I'm feeling shy. shy. <laughs> feel shy. Yeah, it's okay to feel shy. I get it. It's part of it, isn't it? I wonder why when cancers get shy, that's their reaction. This cancer is shy. Who just zipped his fly? <laughs> <laughs> your fly yeah, that's was, why I was vulnerable. Your fly, your fly was literally undone, and you just zipped it up. <laughs> Standing for the gaping hole of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's vulnerable, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you've you've been working on a project with the tarot. You've been mapping, what you love to do. You love mapping. I do love mapping. You love systems and mapping, and you've been mapping the tarot recently. I have been. Kind of remapping. And that's kind of a Venus and Gemini thing, right? Like Gemini's air, it's Mercury. And this connection with Virgo Mercury, but there's this kind of mapping that can go on with both Gemini and, and Virgo. But yeah, you love to create maps. Your Mercury's in Gemini. Mercury's in Gemini right now been your mercury return yeah mercury's coming onto my sun with this whole 
wash of Gemini energy coming through. It seems to me like maps comfort you. Yeah. That's kind of what I was noticing and trying to point out to you last night. Yeah, I was noticing this tendency in myself to come back to this tarot project, which has a very systematic mapping quality. And it somehow gives me peace to put everything in its right place, I think. There's something at the same time that feels a little bit creative about it, that I'm not just affirming a system, but trying to... I read this guy on the tarot recently, I forget who it was, but he said that each seeker's job, each initiate, initiate's task, is to remake the arcana for themselves mm. in the deepest, most profound way that they see fit. Mm. To take the arcana on its terms and the terms that it presents itself and to understand the symbols within your soul and within the soul of the world. Mm. And to broker a new deal, to create a new bridge, to create a new rainbow people, mm. to braid them together, the sky and the earth, to braid together you, the unique particular, with the divine universal rainbow of archetypes. Mm. And the act of creation that takes place in your unique reworking of the timeless symbols. Mm. And you can speak that forth and create that as a system i think system making at its best is that kind of creative artistic endeavor mm. i think it forgets that that's what it is at its deepest level philosophy philosophical system making forgets that at its deepest level it's aesthetic and ethical i was going to say i mean i think my prejudice towards system making is sometimes it just feels like copying or like yeah where's the creative act in it it's like okay just okay you copied it you transcribed it you you know mapped it over but what you're saying is a totally different approach to system making you're talking about imprinting your own unique signature into a system that already exists, but you're recreating it through your own self, and therefore it changes in some significant way. Yeah, and hopefully that is informed by the sense-making act of being in relationship with all the others. You know, and what did, what did you learn from all these symbols actually at work in the world? What can you take from the repository of experience of which you are a little bit of a part and put back in to the universal symbol. Mm. How can you inform the universal symbol and give your experience back to it and expand its breadth and widen its scope in such a way that it drinks in all of real human experience? You know, and that universal, which is just a bare bones archetype blueprint, actually communes with the breath of embodied, grisly <laughs> material life. Well, I mean, like, so you mentioned uh, that we used the deer drum to do the dance of the tarantula, um, which comes from our online course, Deep in Your Astrological Practice, where we went through the 45 planetary combinations or cycles of time. And this is exactly what that course is about. It's about taking the 45 arcana of mm -hmm. the planetary mm -hmm. pairs of, you know, the sun and the moon and the eight other planets in our solar system, which gives you 45 pairs. And I did my take on them, right? There are these timeless universal qualities, these pairs of the 45 arcana, and I did my take on them. But in doing my take on them, it was an invitation and an encouragement for every single person every single student who took the class to do their take on it, but do their take on it through whatever their creative lens and contribution is to astrology. So for you, you wrote 45 original pieces of music and made a piece of music for every single combination. 
because you're a musician. Soleil Chappelle, who is a dancer, danced every 45. Um, we had visual artists who painted. We had poets who wrote poetry. And so the idea was for every person to imprint their particular way of being into the 45 and we created a whole orchestrated cosmic journey through these that ten, you know touched every sensory level of of being human and like that that was actually the point and it's speaking to this depth of a participatory cosmology right like the content and the form were expressions of what you're saying yeah, it's striking me in this moment that each each way that you invited, uh, each way that you invited the people to bring their voice to the table, was a different color of this rainbow. And these unique expressions, this is the braiding together of the rainbow people that comes through the, the participatory experience of there not being one way to be, but there being each unique person's way of being with the timeless wisdom that we all share. And so I want to say that the chariot, the warrior, as secretly fighting in service of the feminine virtue of understanding the importance of relationship, of being in relationship as one of the primary ways of being, mm. it reconfigures the relationship to the ultimate as the one, the purity, the divine, it says no. We discover that in each of our unique approaches to this divine source in which, with which we're in dialogue, mm -hmm. with, in which there's a relationship happening. So the rainbow people is each one relating to the source. And the chariot is the, the warrior that secretly guards this grail that is each person drinking from the source and giving back to the source their own unique voice. There's a question as to why the chariot card is associated with cancer. It seems like a fierce card. It seems like a strong card, but the secret core underneath the crab shell mm -hmm. is the importance of relationship that's being fought for. Mm. I think that was brought forth around the class and the way that the community came together to produce these different approaches upon the wisdom, upon the arcana, upon the dialogue. I mean, I like how you s are framing it this way, like, like saying like the community came together because I mean, that's exactly what happened. I mean, how many people ended up contributing to this 60-hour course by the end? Wasn't it something insane, like 50 people? Yeah, 40 or 50. Artists, musicians, presenters, yeah, astrologers. I think just, just, the, yeah, just the artists were around like 40, and then when you bring in all the other healers, astrologers, seekers that contributed... Yeah, I think over uh, over fifty people. Yeah, I think um, that really speaks to <laughs> you know that famous young phrase uh, like "called or not called, the gods will come." It's like we are the gods and and human form, and <laughs> when called. Turns out people actually really have a lot to say and they want to contribute and there's a lot to create. And, you know, the Saturn Uranus in my midheaven always struggles with this. On the one hand, I'm a deep believer in adhering to tradition and the respect of lineages and honoring our teachers. And, you know, there is a certain way things are done and there's a reason for that. And at the same time, the Uranus in me is like, yes, 
And it's important to break out of those molds, to question authority, to question the past, to question tradition, and to be innovative and creative and say, you know, ultimately, what what's the purpose of any of this? Why are we doing any of this? And it's like, I don't want to study the dead word and stop there. I want to study the past and then use it to be in the present and move forward. And ultimately, I want everybody to get in touch with the fact that they're creators and that they have something important to create and to contribute and that their voice is an important voice to be a part of the dialogue instead of always studying something outside of ourselves, studying another person, studying the past, like all these things. It's like, it's like to remember the reason why we do that. We do that so that we can wake up and create and be inspired. And I just, I don't, it's, I just feel so passionate about that. It feels so important to me. And it's a total cultural paradigm shift, honestly. I mean, the obsession with the rich and the famous, the obsession with, you know, being entertained by whatever. Like, don't get me wrong. You know I love watching movies. You know I love being entertained. I love all that stuff. But, like, hello. Right, and certain, like, obsessions with certain standards of how it's supposed to be, whether that be academic, this is the way it's done, or it be, like, total pop culture, like, this is what looks good, and this is what's hip. You know, it's like, who's deciding that for you? Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we can transition a little bit into some things we were talking about earlier um, around... Um, <sighs> Well, I guess it's like structural poetics of the cosmos of our solar system, uh, particularly in regards to, well, levels of interpretation, Chiron, the asteroids. I mean, I don't know how we want to tackle this beast, which is what it feels like. It feels like a beast to me. So in your, your earlier... Uh, recording I think you were addressing how Chiron was at the heart of each archetype and that it seemed like something was amiss to give Chiron its own archetype this kind of drives me fucking nuts (laughs) honestly it really does it really irks me what is it that irks you about it what feels off it's an obs- it's, a, it's a pointillistic obsession of mm. trying to find the one part in the chart where we're wounded right it's like hello as if it could be one place in the chart that you were wounded yeah it's every single part like every single part is a wound is a challenge and every single part is a gift and an opportunity to heal and 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 grow and 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 share light and love like that's the whole fucking thing that's set up that way Right. And do I think Chiron's real in the chart? Yeah. But so many times people just want to be like, point to like, well, you know, and that's my Chiron. And I'm just like, okay. You're trying to tell me that your Venus rising is in a wound? You're trying to tell me that right. your um, Mars at the midheaven is in a wound? Right. <laughs> Right, and that's where I feel like there's like a little bit of a, a conflation of levels that goes on, something where it feels like the other the other archetypes can be, for example, players in a drama within which a wound gets acted out, and that none of them are like the wound itself, but they play the different roles that creates the scenario within which the wound happens but the wound itself it's on a different level than than the players within the drama for example and i think with some of these concepts there's different levels we want to distinguish i mean it's even making me think in this moment how there's there's a there's a saturn uranus dialectic that transcends your chart right and like the concept of the saturn uranus dialectic isn't located in your chart like the place of my, you know, yeah. of rebellion as a concept is right here in my chart. It's like, yeah, that's a place 
where it's inflected in you, but the Saturn Uranus dialectic transcends your chart, you know? Perhaps in an analogous way that Chiron transcends some point in your chart. Chiron is a, is a deep truth about the fabric of things. Yeah, in regards to the Saturn Uranus dialectic, I remember it's a long time ago, man. It's been a decade ago at this point. I was sitting there thinking about that. I was like, I don't know, maybe I was even at Esalen and I was like sitting under the stars and I was just like contemplating them. And uh, it just like hit me and I was like, oh my God. Like, this has nothing to do with me. The two of you have been at this from the beginning of time. Like, this is an ancient relationship that I'm just like picking up on the middle of a story and I'll have some, you know, <laughs> minimal, relatively minimal contribution to it. However, still one. And of course, they're conjunct in my chart. So, you know, they do feel very relevant to me. But I'm just, these, these beings and these thought forms and these dynamics are so old. And when we incarnate, and we get the chance to experience them in this form or just, you know, tasting them for a fraction of a moment. And <laughs> like they've been happening and they're going to keep happening. And, you know, in regards to, to Chiron, it's just like, I don't know, for example, like I have a client who has Mars rising and she was shamed for her self-assertive expression growing up as a child like from a very young age and she was really given the message stay quiet be still you know it's, that's a very difficult thing for a mars rising person i mean the whole thing is you're bursting out moment to moment with spontaneity and this creative fire and your impulse is your genius i mean that's really what guides you through life and if you're shamed for that and told to do the opposite of that. Think about how deeply wounding that is. Now, okay, this person also has Chiron in the fifth. So in the fifth house, yeah, there is a wounding around creative self-expression. But you can see in the connection to the Mars rising and what happened in the biography. So like I see the connections and I think Chiron in the fifth is really important. And there's a key there as far as when you go into um, creative self-expression and you let yourself be a performer like the fifth house likes, you're unlocking something. But what you're unlocking is you're unlocking the whole chart and you're unlocking all the ways that every part of your chart when you were told to be small and be silent and stand still, your whole chart was told to be silent and stand still. Not just the Mars rising or not just the Chiron in the fifth. The whole thing has an energetic dynamic around it that has that kind of conditioning. So this is kind of more what I'm getting at. It's like, like the whole thing is touched by it and you can get a particular story out of focusing on where Chiron is without a doubt. But I think at the very nature essence of the whole chart is Chiron. Right. Well, it kind of strikes me. It, it points to this question, like, what are we reading when we read the chart? And mm. what, what, are we, what are we seeing finally? Are you seeing, you know, the position of Mars so precisely that you totally understand Mars? The position of Chiron so precisely that you totally understand Chiron? Or are you, like, somehow transcending those symbols and reading themes and stories that aren't embodied by any one of those symbols alone, mm. that are actually embodied by the drama of their unfolding interaction. But these are themes and signatures that when we keep looking at the chart, start to repeat themselves. You know, it, I think what you're pointing out, you know, with this energy around the Mars rising and then a similar fiery energy in the fifth house, Leo, there's, there's a theme there that transcends the symbols themselves, that the symbols will re-speak and reiterate in repetitive difference over and over when we approach the chart in different ways. And this is the point that as you go deeper with progressions and different manners of analysis, you end up coming up with similar patterns that were already there. 
And so I think part of this thing that we're saying about Chiron is an example of a broader phenomena that the themes that we're reading from the chart are deeper than the symbols themselves. They're second order themes that are created by the recombination of those symbols. So to get fixated on the symbols is like to get fixated on, on the letters of the alphabet and think that the meaning is somehow contained in the letter A or the letter B or the letter C. It's like, no, by recombining these symbols, a whole deeper level of analysis is inaugurated. Mm. And we need to read on that level. I think, oh, so many different thoughts there. I mean, one is, is like coming into also seeing that every planetary placement has a need mm. and um if we can approach the chart and understanding that each planet has a need so for example mars rising it has a need to assert it has a need from moment to moment to spontaneously express itself like it needs that channel because that's its path and there's a reason god made you that way it's not an accident you have Mars rising. Like there's a reason for that. But when our needs aren't able to be fulfilled, then they get distorted as a way to try to um, satisfy that placement. And that's where we start to get things like shadow expressions and we start to get things like manipulation. One way or another, the need's going to try and get fulfilled. If it can't get fulfilled in a direct way, then it will start to try and get fulfilled in an indirect way. Or it'll start to go to an attention-seeking habits and behaviors. So, for example, Mars rising could turn into something like um, angry outbursts, um, defensiveness, conflict, um, picking fights, um, easily getting triggered and pulled into fights. Um, the people around you being very aggressive. It's like, it's still expressing itself. It never stops expressing itself. But because its need is unfulfilled, because a distortion has happened, you're bad, you're wrong, you shouldn't do that, you know? So it just starts to get, get contorted and twisted and, you know, it starts to feel more problematic, really. Um, it starts to feel like we're suffering and maybe unnecessarily so because there's a need that's not being fulfilled right. I mean children do this like when they aren't getting enough attention or their need isn't getting met they start doing attention seeking behavior and they start to become annoying and you're like oh my god please shut up what are they doing they're 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 crying out and saying you're not touching me enough you're not loving me enough you're not paying attention to me enough i'm not stimulated enough like whatever it is it's human it's human behavior that's what we all do the thing is, is so many of these patterns get set into place like in the first five or so years of our life you know become coexes and then you know start to show up in different variations and manifestations later uh, that get really like amplified um, and, and often more dramatic, but, um, it's like, okay, you know, you got shy earlier and I could see you were getting shy and like, there's something in me who has Mars rising, who's like, just want to drive right through it. But instead it's like, it's okay to be shy. Like, let's all pull back a little bit. You know, and like if it wants to come around again, as it did, then it will, right? It's like attuning to your nature and being like, okay, like cancer sometimes needs to be self-protective, move slow and ready until they want to put their shield down to expose what's underneath it there, which is a vulnerable process. That's a need. And, and... And our needs often come from our wounds. And so there's a challenge in that for you. Like, yeah, okay, sometimes you get shy and protective and moody as cancers do. But then there's like a gift in that, which is you're an extremely sensitive, emotionally attuned human being who's very nurturing and kind. Like, (laughs) 
th- it always works like that. Some people call it a double-edged sword. Some people mm. call it paradox. Some people call it light and shadow. Like, whatever the fuck you want to call it. It just seems like that's how existence works. So if we, like, pull back from being so focused on Chiron as, like, the thing, we start to, I think... <laughs> I don't know if I want to use this term, but extract the medicine from the chart more, like how to be with ourselves in a deeper, more self-accepting manner, which some people say is like a huge part of the spiritual path, Mm. is self-acceptance, self-love, right? Which is like one main thing that astrology does for you, I think. Know thyself, okay. Know thyself, accept thyself, um... And to recognize there's a reason you're made this way. Yeah, I think there's something about when you start to see it in different places of your chart over and over again that helps you with this insight that you're talking about. That like when you think it's just, if I think it's just my Chiron-Venus conjunction and that's my wound, okay, that's going to tell me something about my wound. But when I realize that, you know, my Cancerian self reiterates you know the wound non-identically that's another part of how i deal with it and i realize again that my moon saturn saturn and libra like does it again and you start to extract from the symbols themselves and you say i'm just i'm just like this like it's written holographically into my chart all the way down and i can't just point to one thing and be like it's because of my you know, Moon and Leo. One can't say that, and one sees that some of their soul stories are beyond needing to be justified, and they're just mm-hmm. they're there to be lived, mm-hmm. and, and that helps the self acceptance process. Oh my gosh, I love that. That is such a good line. Don't don't need to be justified. It's beyond justification, right? I mean, I mean, it's so good. I mean, for, I struggle with this. I think some of my clients struggle with this. It's like, yeah, having is it okay how I am? I don't know. A classic question, especially for women, is like, is it mean I'm codependent that I need a man? Like, mm-hmm. women really deeply struggle with this. Mm-hmm. To be a strong woman, you need to be independent. And if you need a man or you want a man. Does that mean you're weak? Does that mean there's something wrong with you? You should learn to love yourself and be alone before you can be with someone else. You know me. I'm so anti this. I'm just right. like, fuck that shit. Well, the irony is it's forcing you to live the man's model before you're allowed to, to live the relational model. Oh, that's good. <laughs> you're forcing yourself to, to step up to the, the criteria of the individualist model and then maybe you'll be permitted to be in relationship because the patriarch will say... That your femininity has a place at the table, (laughs) which they will actually never say. (laughs) Oh my God, I love it. That's so genius, right? It's like, okay, I play the man's game so that you finally give me permission to be let into the woman's world, right? And uh, as you're pointing out, it's like, guess what? You can hoe that row, (laughs) row that hoe. You can tap that 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 ass. That that row is a long one to hoe. (laughs) Because it don't ever end, yo. I'm going to tell you what. I, I did that. I, I played that game, and I rode that hoe. I hoed that road. I did all the above, hardcore, all the way. And I'll tell you what happens when you get to the end of that shit. They're like, oh, okay. They'll just do that all over again forever. And I'm like, wait, I thought I was not going to be let into the kingdom of heaven, oh, mighty one. And then and you're like. Return to go. Do not collect $200. <laughs> And then it's like, wait, so you're telling me I'll never own Park Place? Right. <laughs> I'm getting off this fucking board game. And then and then that's when you become free. Monopoly. And you're just like, yeah, I'm not going to be part of this monotheistic, monocropping monopoly. Exactly. Like, fuck this shit. So boring, so lifeless, you know? So boring, it's a fucking board game. <laughs> <laughs> Travis doesn't like to play Monopoly. <laughs> that is a board game. <laughs> Can't stand itself. 
that's good. I like that. This is, that feels so empowering to me because it's like when you even reduce the conversation to like, does that mean I'm codependent? It's like, bow, fuck even asking that question. Like we're still within right. that patriarchal right. paradigm. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And as long as you keep using his tools, you're going to be like, what's wrong with me? Oh my God, I'm awful. Mm. Mm. <laughs> no wonder. Mm. Because you desire to dismantle the house, but those tools are only made to keep it together. Mm. So that makes you look like you're broken. Mm. Fucking hate that shit. I just felt so much rage against that, but like stepping out of that, which was a very hard process. I mean, I think the moment that I decided to stop playing the game, it was like three hardcore everyday grieving crying depression anxiety rage like lots of feelings about it like because when you step out of the game like your very survival is threatened on every level Mm. your self-worth your identity maybe you're financially communally socially like all these things Mm. And um, there's a great book, Daughters of Saturn, which talks about this. It was like one of the hardest things about leaving your father's house and moving out from being a daughter of the patriarchy mm-hmm. is like part of the reason why it's so hard and so m- women don't do it is because it's a it's like you have to become depressed. You have to become full of rage. Like you have to feel all these like really intense things you haven't been feeling your whole life. Right. And when you tap into that level of feeling you're not just feeling your own you, you you start to tap into like oh my god this happened to my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother and to my sisters and my friends and this has been going on forever and it's just it's so overwhelming and not to mention that like on a societal level it's very difficult you know for so many different reasons but yeah i guess this is all somehow connected to the chariot the crab shell, you know, what matters is forced to go inward because of circumstances in the environment. Mm. And it gets protected in an inward space until a more hospitable time. Yeah, sometimes you hear people say that like, oh, you know, India has been keeping the spiritual wisdom safe during this era of madness and corporate capitalism and it will all come you know come around sometime but I feel like females the female gender is keeping the wisdom safe Mm -hmm. until the time that we're able to rediscover it Mm -hmm. be together again So maybe this uh, could be a good place for us to move into uh, another delicate subject matter. (laughs) Uh, Let's talk about asteroids. Asteroids. So you know how I feel about the asteroids. You have strong feelings about asteroids. (laughs) Asteroids for you have asterisks. (laughs) Um, it's one of definitely like the top five things that really gets my blood boiling in astrology. Yeah, this is a full on Jessica rant. Um, so, okay. Look, I'm not saying asteroids aren't real. I'm not saying they don't work, that they're not awesome for a lot of people. I, a lot of my students use asteroids. I've gotten reading uh, on the asteroids. They were helpful. And then I'm still going to say what I'm going to say. Okay. But hopefully you don't listen to me unless you actually like that I do this. So there we have it. How does it not fucking kill you that all of the asteroids, almost, are all fucking female goddesses? Like... Are you serious? Just look at it at a complete structural level. You're telling me that other than Venus and the moon, 
all the other planets are male, you know, in the West, Greek Roman gods. And then, therefore, all of the feminine forms and all the female goddesses got relegated to the fucking asteroid belt, shards of fucking rock that are like tiny little pieces in between Jupiter and Mars. It doesn't fucking make any sense. Absolutely, Jessica. It gets me totally riled up because (laughs) it's... It's like we're actually conceding on a structural level that, no, this is how the universe is structured, that the, the, the feminine principle is relegated to this asteroid belt and all the other massive important planets have a, ma- a masculine androcentric emphasis. It's, it, it, in that light, the way you're, you're painting it here, accepting an asteroid cosmology is equivalent to capitulating to patriarchy. I feel like it is. I mean, I understand why it's happened. And I get that like a thousand fucking percent, we need to have the goddesses as part of the pantheon. And I get that when you look up at the sky, which is like the equivalent of looking up at God. And if God's a white man with a beard, you know, that fucking sucks. And if you look up at the heavenly bodies, you're like, oh, Saturn, Kronos, and oh, Zeus, Jupiter, you know, and on and on. And you don't, and you're a woman, and you don't see yourself reflected except in Venus and the Moon. Then yeah, where do you look? Okay, so then we go to the asteroid belt. And there's all these amazing goddesses. I think all those goddesses are real. I think they exist. I just think they're actually a part of the planetary archetypes. I think Juno is equally Jupiter Zeus as the planet Jupiter is. And I think that there's various combinations on it. And there's a lot more to say about what happened to the goddess in the first place. I mean, first of all, almost all of these goddesses in one way or another are defined to a man, either their father or a husband. Some way they were fucked over, kicked out, left out, like, you know, and so like, yeah, is it really easy as a woman or the feminine part of me to identify with these stories? Yes, absolutely. But like, like, no, like, fuck, you know, in her original form of matriarchal consciousness. And before that, the goddess was A, not split off like this. And B, she was not defined by her relationship to what happened to the fucked up man in charge. Like, it just kills me on every frigging level. Absolutely. I want to bring them back home. I want to bring them back into the centerfold. And I want to both honor them in their current patriarchal status because that's real and we need to connect to what's happened to her. And I'd like to have a rebirth of her so that she can... Not just, I don't want her to like go back to who she was before patriarchy or something like that. Like, it's not none of that. But like, can we get back in touch with like her essence as it is, not wholly defined by what happened with the fucked up parts of patriarchy? There's such a deep splitting going on, you know, and the splitting manifests itself astrologically, symbolically, in the splitting between female asteroid goddesses and male planetary gods but it's indicative of a of a deeper thing of not being able to hold the complexity together the complexity of the masculine feminine polarity and so many other complexities and we've actually set this up earlier in the conversation right it's the same way of not being able to hold the the complexity of chiron and how it plays out through through different figures um and the way that through this archetypal repetition, the themes that we play it out, see played out in the ast- the asteroid pantheon are already written there in the planetary pantheon. And it's not that what the asteroids are telling us isn't true, but it's that we can we can also see those same messages already written into the chart on a planetary level. With things, we're talking about something that, re- that reduces the splitting of the psyche that we're. able to see that some of these themes are already present in the chart and that the feminine narratives that have been suppressed are also there if we're willing to bring a really complex nuanced perspective to it and help to bring out that suppressed narrative that's already written in the symbols but needs to be given voice to 
which I think is exactly what you did with your revisioning Saturn piece. I mean, I think that the revisioning Saturn piece was my first big step to saying, look, if you remember, like as in member back together, Put back together, that Saturn has a feminine form, actually a very strong mother component. We think of Saturn, Senex, father, no mother, mater, matter, incarnation through the mother's body. Where the fuck do you think life comes from? Hello. Uh, many people actually consider the physical world to be the feminine world. And, you know, so, okay. Um, y- you know, and all day long I'll hear Saturn, he, Saturn, he, Saturn, he, 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 he. I'm so scared of him. Yeah, I'd be scared of him too. I'm fucking scared <laughs> of a white male fuckhead punishing fucking asshole too. He's like that. We yeah, all are. you know, like no wonder, uh, you know, all the fucking male CEOs and presidents and stuff. It's like, yeah, you're a crazy fucking tyrant. But if you remember that that is not actually what's going on and you bring back in the mother, you bring back in the different parts of physical manifestation and incarnation and that suffering has wisdom and a purpose and a point and that complaining is actually part of being feminine, like, Oh no, you know, oh, well, how about this for example? All value judgments of the negative sides of Saturn are fucking the feminine sides of Saturn. Suffering, pain, mm-hmm. physical embodiment, even birth. Absolutely. Think about how births are talked about. Absolutely, in the Bible, the pain of childbirth is a curse upon women. <sighs> <laughs> you know, and it's like, you know, or, you know, or the fact that like, okay, if we look at perinatal psychology and perinatal trauma and we understand you know we look at it from Groff right we're talking about a white man who never had children coming up with a cartography of the psyche that's rooted in birth trauma from studying patients in non-ordinary states okay there is helpful information in that there is certain levels of validity in that okay why isn't there a woman, better yet, a mother um, who's actually given birth or a midwife who works closely with birth to help round out that material in a true embodied feminine form. Like, how about that on a structural level? You know, how about the fact that it's mostly men and white men in the western world who come up with the schools of astrology and the patented forms of how you participate in it. i'm not saying they're not women i'm not saying there aren't great women leaders we all know that we all know that there are right but it still feels like that's where the experts and the expertise is and then you know we're sitting here you know turning to the asteroids so honestly, I feel like we can get our little fucking scraps of food, our little peas, and be like, oh, thank you, Master, for our little bit of the goddess in the asteroid belt. It's like a turf war, and it's like you can farm this little corner right here, you know, and we'll tax you for it and make you give us free labor and half your crops. But yeah, you can have this. Because the majority of people who actually give readings are women. And the majority of people are actually holding space for people are women. Exactly. So, you know, okay. But, you know, we're just counseling astrologers over here. <laughs> right. It's this, it's this fantasy of the master architect, you know, the disembodied mind that just understands it so perfectly and sees, you know, whether it be the perfect heaven or the perfect earth. You know, in a way, it's like West World's dealing with dealing in that like, oh, we're gonna have the perfect structure for everything to be perfect. How different is that, you know, than the somewhat gung ho spiritual visionary that just says, I see the perfect divine vision, you know, that's dancing out everything perfectly for us with the stars and totally writes out the part that we play in it and the relationships that go on and the way that actually it is on the ground. And who's usually dealing with those relationships on the ground and making sure they actually function and are fluid within families and larger social circles? Usually women. 
Well, how about this? How about all the women who are listening right now? Um, and how about all the men too? <laughs> and how about all the people in the non-binary? Like, let's all be the chariot, right? And be like, hey, we're not going to stand for all the goddesses in the asteroid belt anymore. Let's start doing the work of bringing them back to their rightful place in the equal standing in the 10 major planetary bodies. How about we do that? How about, like Ruth Bader, Gator, Ginsburg, never can say her fucking name right, says, someone said, how many women do you think should be on the Supreme Court? She said nine. They're like, oh my God, how could you say that? She's like, why? There's been nine men forever. Why don't we get nine women on there and see what happens? How about this? How about we turn the whole fucking main, par- uh, the, the main pantheon, how about we get the 10 major bodies and we make them all female for a while and see how that goes. Let's do it for 2,000 years, they balance can, the skills. They can put the <laughs> men in the fucking asteroid belt. Jesus. So anyways, we're not going to do that, but we could for fun. And then, you know, and you know, so all I'm saying is, is to all you astrologers out there listening right now, please, please, for the sake of the goddess, Let's bring her back into where she belongs in the main conversation, not in the little shard shit show that's going on between Jupiter and Mars. And that's what it looks like. When I think of the Ashbrook, I think of like someone took a shit and just like they're all the little pieces of poo are flying around. Absolutely. And I think ultimately this, this is connected to this earlier conversation about a confusion of levels to think that the question of the place of the feminine in the pantheon would take place on the level of the symbols themselves, rather than as a meta conversation about how the feminine expresses through every symbol. Just like we're saying that Chiron would be a symbol among symbols, rather than a principle by which every symbol expresses itself. I think there's a similar confusion going on here, and it's a it's a making shallow of, a, of something that's so much deeper. And I think, you know, we can do it with the best intentions, but we actually, you know, we actually miss the depth of Chiron and of femininity when we try to give them these really local, specific positions within the archetypal pantheon. No, it's a, it's a question that affects every single symbol within that pantheon, every moment. Yeah, and like, why does it feel like, oh no, am I going to be a bad girl because I said this out loud? Like, oh no, am I going to be bad that I just named like the most glaringly obvious fucking structural poetics of our fucking solar system? Mm -hmm. Or like even bringing up Groff's thing. It's like, oh no, is that like dishonoring my teacher and I'm being a bad little girl student? Because I'm like, hey, uh, does anyone else find this like a little strange or awkward? Because it like definitely is not feeling like totally good for me. You know, and it's just like, it can't be so taboo to speak it that we can never engage the conversation in the first place because then nothing can change. If you can't say it, something must already be wrong. Hmm. Well, on that note, (laughs) (laughs) I think I think this is this is the end for now. Thank you so much for uh, doing this stream with me. Jessica, always a deep pleasure. Aw, I love having your voice on here. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. This is Stream, and I'm Jessica DeRuzza, here with Travis DeRuzza. Where the winds hit heavy on the 